All right, hey, what's up, guys? Coach back, play fast football. All right, today we're going to take a look at uh, basing out of the tight front and then kind of the chess match between offensive and defensive coordinator when you're in the tight front, kind of that game within a game, the things we're going to see, the things we need to prepare for, the weaknesses within our defense and how <coughs> excuse me, we can take care of some of that stuff. Make sure you check out some of our partners, Game Strat, Sideline Replay Company we use. Baker Sports is a company that provides us with our uniforms and then our coaches' gear, players' gear, fan gear. Dome Headwear, which is the official headwear sponsor of PlayFest and the school that I'm currently at. If you're looking for custom headwear, check out Dome. Difference USA, the ultimate striking machine. Uh, we have them in our weight room that we use currently, uh, mostly in the off-season, but sometimes in-season as well. Just Play Football, which is the playbook software we use here. We use it for presentations, meetings, sharing things, and then uh, sometimes quizzing our players on the playbook and game plans. High and tight ball security training aid teaches players how to hold the football properly with an instant auditory feedback. TD Publishing, which is great if you're trying to grow your education in coaching. They have books, they have videos, uh, some great topics. They're putting stuff out all the time, working with high school coaches and, and college coaches and putting some really good material out, so check them out. And then Coach Tools, which is a product that we are using right now in the spring. It's, uh, it's a better way of grading your players if you're tired of the old-fashioned way of charting some things by hand and giving kids you know, grades based on uh, the notes you took on a game. This is an exact system. It's customizable menus, customizable tabs, where you can change how you want to grade your players. So it makes it a more productive uh, way to grade your players. And then they can see it uh, on the website, and, and it makes it a lot easier to present it to the players as well. So if you're a tight front team, right now we are uh, basing out of some tight front stuff, and we are basing out of three high within our tight front. That's our base defensive structure right now. One of the things that you are doing is you are trying to take away interior gaps, all right? You're trying to play with a little bit of a lighter box versus one and two back sets, and you're trying to protect your overhangs by taking some of those B-gap bubbles away, and uh, a lot of places that spread or RPO teams want to attack with those bubbles, even the gap scheme teams. Uh, you're taking away bubbles to each side, so you have two B-gap players to each side, uh, which allows you to play your overhangs in the RPO windows a little bit longer uh, and effectively hang a little bit longer in the areas that you think you're going to get the RPO game because there is no immediate open B-gap to fold into. All right, but one of the issues with the tight front are the edges, the C-gap. So I've done a video before on canceling the C-gap and, and deals uh, along you know, those lines, but what ends up happening is when you are a tight front team, a lot of the times people are going to game plan, and I know I use that term uh, generically because every week everybody game plans for an offense, for a defense, for special teams. All right, That game plan is that weekly specific way of how you're going to deal with and attack an opponent. Okay, But when you are a tight front team, the interesting thing about it is a lot of times the tight front, because it's a little bit different in nature, it causes teams to almost game plan, and the reason I use a game within a game, it's almost like teams have to play a completely different game within the, the game they're already playing within their offense. So a lot of times, offenses will have some things in their structure, all right, or in their playbook that they like to attack the tight front, but a lot of times it makes offenses think about some things that they have to do, making sure they carry pin and pull schemes, and then if they're going to be in their read game, what are they going to do with the big gap player? Are they going to have to arc release on zone? So it causes the offense to kind of, you know, maybe wrinkle some things a little bit, which we want to do as a defense, we want the offense to have to practice extra things that aren't part of their base. It makes them maybe carry some things that they don't normally carry or try and run some things and be a little bit better at some things that they normally all right, don't major in. And then it kind of gives some issues in pass protection because are you going to full slide it, put it back on the edge? Where are you going to insert it back if you're a double team, uh, a double read team? Are you going to try and fan it if there's edge pressure? So it creates some issues in the run game and in the passing game. But the first thing we have to understand as a tight front is the issues it creates for us. All right? And one of those issues is soft edges in that immediate C-gap area. And if teams are going to put a tight end body or a three-man surface in there, what are the things we are going to do to you know, have to alleviate that? And right now we're going to talk about it from just a tight front theory. We're not going to talk about playing other fronts because obviously if you're an odd structure team, you're going to want to carry even fronts. If you're an even structure team, you're going to want to carry odd fronts. And most of the time, if you look at NFL or college football games, a lot of times they do that in passing situations. So their base defense, if it's odd, they usually on third and longer situations where they're trying to generate pass rush, a lot of times they'll go to an even front. If they're an even front team, a lot of the times they'll generate pass rush from an odd front because it makes that team have to 
protect and have pass protection rules for both fronts, the front that they see every down in base situations and then possibly the fronts that they see in passing down situations. And I would imagine at this point, you know, where we are in football and everything being, um, you know, so dynamic and, and constantly evolving, most teams have to prepare for even and odd structures every week. So it's not as much of a wrinkle anymore. But when it's not true odd, old-fashioned Oki 050 or, you know, the, the 3-3 three, three stack 050 when it's 0-4-I-4-I, four, four, it kind of puts some wrinkles and some pass protection rules too. All right, but the first thing we have to understand is if they give us a body in the C game, how are we going to take care of that? All right, because we know they have leverage on the 4-I with the tackle. If we give them immediate leverage with the tight end, how are we going to support that edge in the tight front? Now, if we bump the front, all right, to three-man services and we play like a shade front, all right, or if we play the four-eye to a back and we play a shade and a five away, well, now we're out of the tight front. So now it's not really a tight front argument anymore because we're not in the tight front anymore. Okay, so one of the things that we are going to do is we are going to put a backer up in the C-gap while still keeping the D-line in the tight front. And a lot of people will call it, you know, look at it as mint front or something else, but it allows us to play the D-line in the tight front, okay, and it allows us to take care of one of the C-gaps right away. So for us, it's usually our Mike linebacker, all right, so we would walk our Mike linebacker up to the tight end and put him in the C-gap at the tight end because now if they want to run those pin-pull schemes, they've got to be able to pin the four-eye and the Mike, which allows our backside players, all right, to rotate and, and get to the ball when they get their reads if it's a pin-and-pull deal and we got pullers our second and third level player should be clean or cleaner because now it eats up one of the pin blocks on that side. So for us, it's a version of the mid front, all right? So we still try to play it out of our three high structures. So we might have to make some adjustments where maybe the will comes back into the box, all right? And then depending on what we're doing in the secondary with our safety structure from our three high deal, what coverages we're playing, all right? But the first issue is if we want to stay in a tight front with the three interior guys, and we don't want to create a shade front or create an over front, all right? One of the things we need to do if we want to stay tight front is we've got to cause or give some C-gap presence, okay? So easy, the easiest thing for us immediately right away is going to what I look at as the mint front. Other people may look at it differently. I know generically speaking, the mint front usually has from 3-4 structure, the jack linebacker coming away from the star, so for us, if this was our nickel or our Sam or star, all right, and that essentially becomes our jack, Will can go back in the box and now we can play the, the coverage structures the way we need to play them. So, you know, if it was a 3-4 a, a deal, there would be two backers in the box and then the jack walked up and then however you handle your two by two tight end structures, right? So the mid front is normally that fourth rusher and, and depending on where you study it or who you studied it from or how you've learned it, all right. A lot of times it could be that fourth rusher coming from inside, outside, different spots. For us, it's normally the fourth rusher coming away from the nickel is how I learned it. But when we're playing our three high structure in a tight front, one of the ways we do it is we play the mid front and we send the fourth rusher from the tight end because it protects the C-gap edge for us without having to shade or change the front, if that makes sense. So in order for us to stay tight front, okay, we play the mid front from the tight end. So we, we tag it to our fourth rusher and we tag it tight so that the fourth rusher knows to come from the tight end. So if it was two by two, he's going to come from the three attached side. All right, so number two attached, three man surface, sorry, not number three attached, three man surface, two attached. If they give us trips, all right, and we see, you know, if we were to see trips with three attached on this side, well, now we're going to bring the fourth rusher from the tight end. And the reason we, we, we build it in that way right now is we want to protect the C-gap to the side of the three-man surface. We don't want to give them all that immediate leverage, a down block on a four-eye, a down block on a micro-will. So we want to protect the C-gap to the tight end surface. Okay? We can do it from the field. Okay? We can do it away from the passing strength or in pass protection. If we're trying to attack pass protections, we can do it different ways. Generically for us, base camp rules, we want to bring the fourth guy from the side of the tight end to protect the tight front. Again, I'm talking about deals where we are not moving or changing the structure of the tight front. Okay, so yes, we will play some over fronts or some shaded fronts. All right, yes, we will play 
five technique, shade, four eye. We will play other fronts, but when we're talking about the generic type front, we're looking at ways of how we can protect it. All right, so for us in our three high deal, we would bring the mic up there. All right, if it was trips or tray attached like this, we would play palms with corner safety, Sam there, and then the middle safety becomes the next deal in the palms progression where he has three in and up. All right, Sam has three out. We play our normal palms rules on the outside. Backside can play a single side menu where they can play their sky, their, uh, their cloud hard, or their hawk or cone concepts on the backside. Right, the willy, depending on where the back is. If the back is strong, the willy might have to attach four strong and add himself to the coverage. If the back is weak, then the willy can just play on the weak side. We leave the four eye on the back side right now, initially in our tight front. And the only thing is he's got a ricochet versus pass sets when I'm sending the mic. In our base tight front deal, the mic is a secondary contain rusher, so the four eyes don't have to ricochet outside for contain. All right, when we send the mic as a fourth, our backside four eyes. So we, anytime we send the mic tight, we make a mic right or a mic left declaration, all right, and then generally we move the nose away from the mic and leave the four eyes in the run game where they are, and then burst past the, the end away from the four eye away from the mic has to ricochet outside for contain because we don't have a secondary contain player. In our base deal, the mic is our secondary contain player. Also, the reason we use in our defense the mic as the fourth rusher and we pick our personnel that way is because in our base three high structures, the mic isn't part of the coverage. So as soon as we want to add a fourth and try and stay within our base three high tight principles and not change our structure behind it, the mic makes logical sense for us because he's not part of the coverage anyway, so everybody else can play the coverage the way it needs to be played, and then any formations that may cause wrinkles or things, you know, adjustments or adaptations, we build onto it from there. All right, so the first thing we do is we add, all right, the mic as a fourth rusher, and then the second thing we do is we go to bear looks where we bring the Sam and the Will up on the ball. Mike stays in the box, okay, and then behind it, we're either three under three deep, all right, so we can take our two safeties and play them as two seam players, take our middle safety and make him a middle of the field. This can be effective because our middle of the field safety is involved in all of our coverages and a lot of our run fits. So when that kid becomes experienced enough to learn how to, how to spin, all right, and line up in his normal deal. So if he lines up eight by one over number three here, they're kind of thinking he's going to be in a run fit. They're thinking he's going to be in coverage. When he can spin back to play the deep middle and close the middle, it's an effective way for us to close the middle of the field because we're middle of the field open. It's really a good disguise because he's down so much for us as a hybrid linebacker. So now we can get it to where we are three under, three deep, all right, and we're basically zone blitzing it, and we're bringing guys on each edge, all right, and then depending on personnel, game plan, our players, their players, we determine whether we want to spill or box. Sometimes we will spill everything out of that. Sometimes we will box and turn everything back inside. Really depends on... Game plan, our kids off the edge, what they do best, what the other team does. All right, so now we've got immediate edge pressure. So C-gap on the open side, probably outside. The t most of the time with a tight end, we're going to come from outside of that. Okay, so now what we're doing is in the tight front, we are weak to each edge. We're weak in the C-gap. we got to cancel C-gaps. So we bring a fourth rusher up and cancel one C-gap. Then we bring two rushers up and cancel both C-gaps, which most of you are going to look and say, well, that's old-fashioned bare front. Yeah, pretty much it's old-fashioned bare front. That's how we protect our tight front. We bring one C-gap player, then we bring a C-gap player from each edge. All right, so now when the offense is starting to think pin and pull, they're starting to think all the ways they can, <coughs> excuse me, they can get the ball to the edge. Now we're, now we're presenting on-the-line players that are making it a little bit more difficult all right, within their structure of if they had read game with arc release, now what are they going to do if they're trying to read the four eye and arc? Does the arc block now have to handle the man on the line of scrimmage because he's got somebody four eye and somebody covering him? All right, not necessarily man on, man outside, but whatever their rules are. If he's going to arc the four, now when he arcs the four, there's a C gap player there. So it might change some things in the read game. All right, now if they're going to pin and pull, if we come, the reason we come from outside of tight end is it also, in my opinion, possibly affect some of the pin and pull deals. So now if they're going to pin and pull and they're going to try and get guards out or whatever, now if he pins the four, they got to figure out what they want to do with that Sam if he's in a nine. All right, now they got to figure out are they going to try and get him to a backer and now first guard has either got to kick or log the Sam depending on the Sam's technique and then the second guard has got to fit up in there wherever he fits depending on how they block the Sam. Are they going to try and base block 
or kick the Sam out with the tight end and now get the two pullers turned up inside. So it affects their pin and pull deals. It affects their read game. All right, some of the deals that they want to do. A lot of times now you're going to get some tackle pull deals, right? So in, when you're playing tight front, you're going to see a lot of tackle pull. So now if they want to leave the guard on the four eye and pull the tackle, well, now they've still got another player coming off the backside that they've got to be able to handle either in read game or something else. If they're running power with no read game, well, now they've got to be able to handle that guy off the edge because they blocked the four eye back. So when you start playing tight front, the thing I love about the tight front, not only the theory of taking away the two B gaps, not only the theory of a light box and, and your apex players being able to defend RPOs, but the thing I like is a lot of times it forces the offense, and you'll hear guys talk all about it, we got to have our tight beaters ready. All right, we got to have our tight beaters ready. Well, from a defensive standpoint, what I really like about that is if they have everything schemed for their tight beaters, now we know what we have to defend. We know the things that we have to protect. Okay, so instead of getting their whole offense, we might get a portion of it because of what they like versus the tight front. Well, if we know what they like versus the tight front, now as a defense, we should be able to practice a little bit better and know the things that we have to take away and then know the next all right, uh, component to build in off the constraint that the tight front creates on the offense. So if we know the constraint that we're causing on the offense and we know what their answers are, well now it's easy for us to try and think about what's the next thing we want to build in. Okay, so in today's video I'm talking about just C-gap presence out of the tight front. So bringing a fourth and then bringing the bare front, which is five, all right? The next thing obviously would be stemming and moving and playing other fronts, right? So if, if, you're, if you're a tight front and you're always, you know, four-eye, four-eye, Mike, Will, Sam, middle safety, however you're playing it, right, whatever your structure is, well, the next deal obviously from that personnel group would be whoever your fourth rusher is stemming. And, and moving, so whether it be stemming to a shade front, if you want to just stay three down, and you stem and now the end, you stem and you move to where you go four eye to the back, but now we're going to end up moving to shade five on the front side because that's a different picture, and now that affects the pin and pull rule. So now if they're trying to go pin pull and trying to get the guard out, can that center reach the e shade? Okay, because a lot of times if they're going pin pull, getting the guard out, they're asking the center to handle the nose by himself. So now if the, nose does, if the center doesn't have an angle on the nose and he's a shade and we move, all right, so when I say move and stem, I mean we line up in four eye, we line up in tight, and then as they go, or whether it's when the quarterback puts his hands under center or whatever their deal is in the, in the shotgun, we move to shade five, all right, four eye on the backside. So we're now playing five, shade, four eye here. So now we're not double four eye tight front, we've moved to a shade front, okay? We could stem it to, oh, to, to some type of even front, all right? So we could go from our tight front deal, and now we could stem the other way, and we could go five, stem the nose to a shade, stem the four eye in tighter to a three, and now bring a backer or somebody up on a ball and stem to where we're playing more of an over deep, okay? So within the tight front, the video today was more about how we protect the tight front with the fourth rusher and then the double edge kind of bear looks. But one of the things as a defense, the next thing you're going to look at is going to be stems and how we're going to create some pre-snap movement. Okay, not for, not 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 post-snap. All right, some three snap, some, some pre-snap movement with stems and how we're going to move from the tight front to over under or something along those lines. Okay, and then. Obviously, for us, the next thing would be being able to carry our normal odd pack, our normal stack package, so end nose anchor, okay, and then somewhat of our 3 3 stack deal, however, we want to play that within our, if we can play it from our three high structure or if we have to change to more of a 3 3 5 generic base structure that's not three high, okay, so if we had to possibly change the split field and now play with one of the safeties as a nickel and use the middle safety as a high guy to get to our normal split field. But we definitely want to be able to create that original stack box that we played from before, all right, that is different than the tight box. Now it's a six-man box, not a five-man box. Instead of four eyes, you got fives. That starts to affect the leverage. It starts to affect the game plan of the pin pulls and 
pulling tackles and blocking guards back. So the angle change, the leverage changes. All right, so the first thing in our tight front we do is we add a fourth rusher. We're doing it to the tight end right now or from the field or the passing strength. We can do it away from the passing strength. Um, we can do it from the weak side, strong side, however we want to dictate it. Right now we're doing it from the tight end versus 11 personnel. Okay, then we go to bare front. We bring double C gap guys while still playing a tight front. All right, so it's tight front for the inside three, two edge players, the Sam and the Will for us in our defense. All right, the next step in our process would be stems. The next step after that would be playing other fronts like our stack front. Okay, so the great thing about the tight front is, in theory, what we're trying to do, light box, take away B gaps, let the overhangs hang a little bit longer in the RPO game, create some rule uh, discrepancies for the offense within their base gap or zone schemes and their read schemes, trying to make them practice some different things, make their kids learn some extra things, right? But at the same time, we've got to be prepared as a tight front team with what the answers are and how we work on those answers to beat the other team. So tight front, add a fourth, double edge bear, and then the next thing for us, once we got out of the tight front, would be stemming to another front or playing a different front in general. All right, I hope that helps you guys. If you're in spring ball, I hope everything's going good. I hope everything, everybody stays healthy. All right, continue to work and continue to get better. I appreciate everything you do for me. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, turn the notifications on so you know when videos come out or when we do any YouTube live stuff. Thumbs up, thumbs down if you like or don't like the comment because uh, the content because it helps us. I respond to every comment that I can get to. If you leave a comment, I'll make sure I get back to it. All right, so again, I appreciate everything you do for us. Remember, you won't play well until you play fast. See you next time.